And today, we're looking at what's the best way to increase the fruit and veg for you or a person that you support. And is it actually worth the effort? Because there is always a time and um, an effort investment. So we need to weigh up whether, whether it's worth it or not. So, oh, there we go. Oh, love when these things work. That's cool. So pretty, pretty good. About a third of you smashing um, five or more. Um, and then most people getting three to four, which is, which is good. So good effort. You know, if, if, um, if you're on one or two at the moment, then, or, you know, aim for three. Um, or if you're on three or four, then obviously we can get five. But let's see if it's worth it or not. Let's see if you should even bother trying to improve or whether you should just keep doing what you're doing. And at the end of um, that chat, we're going to go into the pros and cons of veganism, if there are any um, cons of, of veganism. Um, and we'll, we'll get through as much as we can. So there's a lot to cover and a lot of content. So let's get straight into it. So today's focus is if you want to help the people that you support to lose weight, feel better and massively reduce their risk of preventable illness, then this webinar is for you. If you want to lose weight, feel and perform better and massively reduce your risk of preventable illness, then it's for you. If you want a simple, quick and easy way to help the people that you support to increase their fruit and veg, again, you're in the right place. And if you're determined to help the people who you support to meet the minimum health guidelines, then this webinar is for you. So just to reiterate, what we're talking about here is, is the minimum health guidelines, really. We're not, um, we will talk a little bit about what optimal looks like but um, we've got to walk before we can run. So what's to come? We're going to look at what our sad diet is, uh, why it's killing us. And, and the people that we support. Sounds quite rash, but it's, it's just a bit of reality, really. Um, why eating more fruit and vegetables is like building your own army to fight disease in your body. How much fruit and veg do you actually need to look, feel and perform at your best? And then why, why do a lot of these ideas to increase fruit and veg actually fail. We've all tried things and they failed, but, but why? That's, that's the key thing we're gonna look at. So we're also gonna go back and look at um, one of the support practitioners, Claire, who helped the person that she was supporting to eat smoothies and cook dinner for the family, which, um, which is a little bit of a shock to everyone in a, in a very good way. So let's bring it back to why. Why even talk about fruit and veg? Well, we've, we spoke about this last week uh, or the last webinar, and we're probably going to talk about it again, again, because it's, it's not going away. And, it, and it's quite a shocking um, statistic that we know that life expectancy uh, in Scotland is increasing, probably due to medical advancements in science. But from a behavioral perspective, we're not really getting much um, in terms of our quality of life. So we only live into about 61 uh, disability free. And that can be changed if we hit the minimum health guidelines. And today we're talking about the, the fruit and veg. So 84% of the deaths when they do come around are actually preventable. We know this from a huge amount of research to the point where it's not opinion. It's just kind of fact and we can, we can act upon that. Um, and I'm just going to show you a quick video of... Um, a video about your gut bacteria. It sounds a bit strange talking about gut bacteria, but your fruit and veg is really, really closely linked to your gut bacteria. And it might be a bit of a foreign concept, um, but this is a really good video. This just gives you a bit of a background as to what it is and, and why getting your fruit and veg is so important. The next time you look in the mirror, think about this. In many ways, you're more microbe than human. There are 10 times more cells from microorganisms, bacteria, viruses, fungi, than human cells in and on our bodies. And our genes are outnumbered 100 to 1 by microbial genes. Scientists even have a name for all these microbial genes, the human microbiome. Now, this might make a lot of people rush for the hand sanitizer. But it turns out most of these microorganisms aren't bad. Germs that will make us sick, most are good. And without these good microbes, our bodies don't seem to do as well. We don't seem to be as healthy, and we actually might get sick more often. 
So one question is, where do our microbiomes come from in the first place? Well, like a lot of things, it starts with our mothers. As the infant passes through the birth canal, it gets coated with microbes from the mom. These microbes may kind of seed the baby with just the right mix. Combined with bacteria and breast milk and other microbes we encounter early on, they seem to slowly take shape in our first few years of life. The overall mix of our microbes becomes very personal, sort of like a fingerprint or maybe a blood type. But our microbes tend to resemble those of our parents and siblings and may stay with us for much of our lives. They may also be doing all sorts of things, such as educating our immune cells, like this one teaching them the difference between things they should fight off, bad bugs that might make us sick, and things that aren't a threat, like our good microbes. When we're adults, microbes become our first line of defense, fighting off germs that try to invade our bodies, protecting their turf while protecting our health. Scientists have discovered they can even spew out their own antibiotics. The types of microbes in your body vary depending on exactly where they live, like different ecosystems in nature. There are wet places like our mouths, noses, and armpits, oily places like our scalps and backs, and dry places like our forearms. Different species of microbes have adapted to each of these habitats. The biggest, most important microbial habitat seems to be in the gut. It's the most complex, the most diverse, and everything microbes are doing everywhere else in our bodies, fighting off infections, revving up and dampening down our immune systems, signaling cells, that's all happening in the gut in spades. They even seem to help regulate our metabolisms, how much energy we burn and how much fat we store. So if it's not functioning properly for some reason, because of what we eat, antibiotics we take, that may actually lead to all kinds of diseases. Diseases like colon cancer, colitis, maybe even diabetes and obesity. Some scientists think one reason a lot of diseases are increasing is because we've lost key gut microbes. Our microbiomes look far less diverse compared to those of people in less developed countries and earlier generations. And remember how we get our microbiomes in the first place? From our mothers when we're born and from breast milk? Well, some scientists think that too many babies aren't getting that because of all the C-sections and not enough breastfeeding, plus all the antibiotics kids get these days and our obsession with cleanliness. All this may help explain why problems like asthma and allergies have been soaring. Maybe because our microbiomes never taught our immune systems how to work the right way. Maybe swallowing good microbes, probiotics, could prevent and treat some diseases. So could taking prebiotics, essentially food that good microbes love. We end our story with a reminder. This research is really new. We still have a lot to learn about what many of our microbes are really doing. But scientists say that it's getting clearer and clearer that the tiny organisms all over our bodies are essential to our health and happiness. Okay, so that's a fairly long video there. So, but the point there is that not to rush out and buy probiotics and prebiotics necessarily you need to be very careful with with where you buy those from but all your gut bacteria feeds on fiber which you get from your fruit and veg so if you want a healthy gut and healthy diverse microbiome then we need to give it we need to feed it essentially with with the right food and that's why fruit and veg is so key and like they said in the video if we can do this we can reduce blood pressure improve cholesterol reduce our risk of heart attacks and strokes, it improves our blood sugar levels, reducing the risk of diabetes, it improves our mental health. In fact, 90% of your serotonin, which is a key hormone for regulating good mental health, is actually stored in your gut. And there's a new um, nervous system, enteric nervous system, they found a direct link between your gut and your brain, which is crazy. 
And with that, it improves our mood regulation, energy levels, confidence. It helps us regain control of nutrition as we're able to regulate our appetite better, improving our mental performance, concentration, and obviously weight loss as well. It reduces our risk of infection and therefore risk of colds and flu viruses. It improves our immune system function. So they're absolutely key. Now you can't just take um, multivitamin tablets because if you do that then you're not going to get the phytonutrients the phytonutrients are really smaller than micronutrients they're tiny but they're found in the skin um, and in the fiber of fruit and veg and if you try and supplement you, you cannot get those and so that's another reason why fresh fruit and veg is so is so key and if we do this it, it quite literally does give our body an, an armor it's like having mi5 in your body going around and figuring out who's evil so you get these free radicals um from basically from an unhealthy lifestyle if we're not able to eat much fruit and veg we're not getting activity levels we get free radicals which denature our dna and it can lead uh, to cancer and that's why we know that increasing activity levels to a to just a even just a little bit and increasing fruit and veg reduces the risk here so what is good nutrition? Well, good nutrition really is, is a non-negotiable, really. If you think about eating a minimum of five portions a day should be seen as a necessity, not a lifestyle luxury. Um, and so good nutrition is it has a dose response between with fruit and veg. We know that five is a good is, is a good goal to get to, but we know that if we aim for more than that, then we get even more health benefits so if, you, if you're struggling to get five you might want to aim for seven or eight and then if you undershoot you're still getting five or six but why is it so hard well like any behavior changes it's often to do with how motivated you are and your ability so we might go through bursts of motivation and when you do have motivation you can do things that are quite hard but the problem is motivation fluctuates and when the motivation does get lower, as it inevitably will, we really need to make things easier for ourselves in order to keep ourselves on this action line. And so when we fail, it's often because we try and do too much too soon. We either lack the motivation and or we make things too hard for ourselves. So making it easy is absolutely key. And we're going to talk about our favorite strategies for making it easy a bit later on. But none of that will happen unless there's a prompt. So you can be motivated to do something and you might it might be quite easy for you to do. But if you don't have a prompt to remind you to do it, then it's not going to happen. Now, with nutrition, you're going to get hungry. That's your prompt. But often when it comes to um, planning and preparing your nutrition, we often need things like shopping lists, et cetera, to, to, to keep organized. But if you're working with the people supported, then you are probably the prompt in, in many ways. You can even just be the one to ask the question, bring up the topic and bring it to, to the attention. Then we can start having that, having that conversation. Uh, but how do, we, how do we put it into action? So here's a good example um, from Claire. We had her on the video two weeks ago and um, she absolutely smashed it with the steps, but she didn't just stop there. She's based up in the Highlands um, and she was a member of our Accountability Academy, which um, we'll also put the link to that in the uh, in the chat. If anyone wants to get involved, uh, you can still get involved for July. And here's what she did. Um, once we got the steps up and running, we looked at the kind of food side of it as well. Yeah. So. Do you remember that with the smoothies? The smoothies was a big one with him. Yeah, yes, yeah, so talk us through that because you, that was quite a, a quite a clever little technique because you said that before he would never have, you would never have bought into trying a smoothie, but you, you turned up, right? And you were drinking one? <laughs> yeah, it was sneaky. I was a bit sneaky with it. So I knew that I eat lunch with him during my support because I'm there for almost the full day. So he always was asking me what I was having and what was in it. So I thought I could use this to kind of put smoothies into his his ideas, really, because he wasn't keen on it. 
he didn't want to have any fruit or veg in the diet. That was a big no-go. And obviously, we spoke about how important that was. So what I did was I made a smoothie myself and took it with me when I was supporting him. And I could see him looking at it. <laughs> and he kept looking at it and looking at it. And then he said to me, oh, what is that? And when I told him it was a smoothie and it had fruit in it, he was shocked. And then I said to him, like, he talked about it being his favourite colour, because um, I'd done that as well, made sure it was red. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's all the berries in it because his favourite colour is red. So I knew, I knew that would appeal to him. So he he then basically said yes because I said to him, why, why don't we try and make a smoothie? I think maybe he would like one. And he was like, okay, I'll, I'll try it. I probably won't eat it, but I'll try it. So the next time I was supporting him, we made a smoothie and he loved it. Mm-hmm. And then he has a smoothie every single day. He loves it. Wow. That's so that awesome. was that was his way of getting our our way of getting the fruit in there into his diet. There you go. Um, one. So we've covered a lot so far, but let's dive into exactly what we have. So eating eating fruits and veg is the best body armor you, you could hope for um, for the people that you support, but also also yourself. It keeps your gut um, bacteria healthy. Your microbiome diverse um which as we're learning is is still a very new area of science but we know it's linked with everything um and so we if we don't give that gut bacteria what it needs then then it's going to suffer but this can all seem quite daunting you know i mean there's a lot to take in and there's a lot of things you could do and it can make things a bit confusing and wondering well there's lots of different paths here which one do i take it's much easier if you've got a guide and a map and you could go alone and you could try and do these things um, independently and, and give it a crack but you don't have to you can join um, the accountability academy and get basically free pt and physio from one of the health by science coaches and you can do that by clicking the link um, in the chat and if you turn up you you will get results you know you will fail but that's okay because when you fail you learn and that's how we get results uh, in the Accountability Academy. And here is some more results um, that Claire managed to get from working with the person that she was supporting when she was uh, part of the Accountability Academy. And then I moved on from there as well because it started that it was a smoothie. And then I started thinking about what maybe could be some other things that we could include the fruit and veg in as well. And it kind of continued into a bit of life skills in that, you know, we got him a folder. Um, he's actually got two folders. He's got one for his exercise with his step recordings in it. And then the other one is his recipe folder. So he's got his smoothie section, breakfast, lunch and dinner. So when we started doing all this, I started on the smoothies. Then we moved on to the breakfast part. So we make we would make different breakfasts, then we moved on to lunch, and now we've moved on to dinner. So he makes dinner once once a week. He makes dinner for his whole family, which he's never ever done before, or his parents never saw coming. But yeah. he's just got so into it; he absolutely loves it, and it's good as well because not only is he doing it, but he's got the recipes there now in his folder, so that when he does move on. Um, into more independent living he can look back on that and have all these recipes that he knows that he's capable of making yeah so, so it's really been for his started off steps once we've got that going smoothly then we've taken it into the food part as well so yeah there's the link again that um you guys can access if you if you want to join so the easiest way to think about getting your fruit and veg in is to think of the rainbow now unfortunately i'm not talking about skittles um or that's very good marketing for these guys we're really trying to talk about getting as many colors of fruit and veg as you can and each color corresponds to a, the different benefits so obviously we have green red slash purple um orange yellow and then purple at the end there so um when you're looking at your own nutrition just think about how many different colors you have in your plate and if you're not getting much veg at the moment 
the key is just to get anything like it all counts but if you're at the point where you're successfully and consistently getting a decent amount of fruit and veg in, then you can start to think about the different colors to ensure that you're getting a really diverse amount of fruit and veg in, in your diet. And the health by science, we, we like to, again, try and simplify this process. When, when you're thinking about your main meals, we like to use the health by science plate. So we've got protein there because that is key. We know that it's the only macronutrient where you need a minimum amount, which is 1.2 grams per kilogram of body weight. Um, but, but when you're dealing with carbs and fats, they, they, they fluctuate depending on your energy needs and your preferences. There is no ideal amount um, for those. But with vegetables, it's as many as you can. So that's why in our plate, we've got it full. And it's, what's the first question on the plate, which is where are my veggies? That's the first thing we want to think of. Whereas traditionally we might think where are my carbs, you know, rice, potatoes, pasta, bread, whatever. And then you might think of the sauce and then you might think of the, the protein and veggies are kind of afterthought. We need to flip that round and go, where are my veggies? Where's my protein? And do I need carbs? Because if you're getting a lot of fruit, then you may or may not need carbs. It's not a low carb kind of approach. It's just, it might be a lower carb approach if, if, um, if that's what's needed. But what does a portion of vegetables actually look like? So the easiest way to do it is for non-starchy vegetables um, is, is one fist. So if you hold your fist out, it's proportional to your body size. And we know that that's a good gauge to go off. So you're looking at your plate, we want to aim for about three fists or, well, the more the merrier, but three is a good target to go for. And that can be spinach, broccoli, beans, carrots, sweet corn, cauliflower, any, any type of veg, um, we do need a decent volume of it. And we all we repeatedly do. So whenever we make these changes, it is tempting to go from zero to hero, but we like to use um, our avatars, perfectionist Pete and consistent, not consistent, <laughs> consistent Colin, uh, to demonstrate the different approaches. Now, most people try and go for the perfectionist Pete approach because they're really motivated. They think, right, I'm going to attack this and try and maximize my fruit and veg, which is admirable. Um, you know, you might start off on two and think, well, that's it, more the better, I'm going for eight just like perfectionist Pete, and you might achieve that. You get planned and prepared and you you hit, hit the ground running and it's going pretty well until Wednesday comes around and, and life happens and you, you know, who knows what, but it will guarantee that life will happen and punch you in the face and stop you in your tracks temporarily. That's, that's, just, that's just life. But that can knock people off their, um, off their feet. And if, if you set your expectations too high, and then you take a big hit, it's very difficult to get the motivation to do it because going for that massive change was just, it was just unrealistic. It was never going to happen and, and ultimately ends up in failure. And so when we look at the, the total, even though perfectionist Pete uh, had a strong start with a little fluctuation in between, he managed to get 24 portions in the week. And when we compare that to consistent Collins approach, Again, he started on two, but he's gone from modest five, which is still quite punchy to be fair. He's more than doubling his, his uh, fruit and veg intake, but modest, more modest than the perfectionist approach. And he's able to achieve that Monday and Tuesday because again, he's very motivated and he's keen to get started. Again, you can take a dip, life happens, but when you set the target at something more realistic, it's much more easier to get back on the horse and continue where you left off. There will be dips as there were on the Saturday for him, but because you've made it easier for yourself, it doesn't require as much motivation in order to sustain it. So in that example, even though perfectionist Pete has set his target lower than perfectionist Pete, he's actually getting 31 portions. Um, he's actually, um, having more, that's the wrong graph, <laughs> but again, 33% more fruit and veg than perfectionist Pete. So starting out, you might have your money on perfectionist Pete, but slow and steady wins the race. Ultimately, it's going to lead to better results in how you feel and how you perform. And when you do have these little setbacks, it's like you will will 
the people you support will you can guarantee that, that you will fail in some small way but that is okay that's where the treasure is because it's those little setbacks where the learning takes place and if you embrace that you can move forward if you kind of see that as black and white well i'm just not very good at this and i haven't got what it takes then you, then you're guaranteed to fail but if you look at that set your targets a bit more modestly learn from your setbacks you will get the gold because that's what success really looks like even though we like to think that it looks like that and so between being perfect and just giving up there's better and that small and steady consistent approach is is the better approach so like i said in those examples you can see how both perfectionist p and consistent colin um were motivated at the start but when perfectionist pete struggled he needed a lot more motivation because he what he was trying to do was much harder to achieve whereas because consistent colin made it easier he doesn't need as much motivation so it's nothing to do with willpower and personal attributes it's to do with your ability and, and how easy you've made it for yourself because your motivation will go up and down and so it's much safer to make your habit smaller but consistent because that is what leads to success so what what change ideas could you test well we've got um loads of ideas not change ideas cheat sheet which you can get from the health by science website um there's absolutely loads i've just put in a couple here but some big ones are um you know having two fist sized portions of fruit with breakfast um being boring <laughs> it sounds it sounds boring but um being consistent with your fruit and veg and eating the same ones that you know you like you know you can prepare quickly and easily actually is makes life much much easier because you've got less thinking to do you can also try the daily dozen challenge so i got this from a resource from um andrew thompson uh, which is quite interesting and there's an app that you can access that um you can find in the chat box and this is quite a clever clever idea so he's basically identified the kind of most nutrient dense um foods um or 12 of them really including water and he's put exercise in there as well and you basically go through the day and try and try and tick these off as a bit of a challenge so that could be a, a little um you could try and gamify it with for yourself or a person you support that's another little change idea you could try you could try eating the rainbow so you can um in our resources pack on our website we've got some simple printouts you can use with the people you support and just try and count how many different portions of fruit and veg a person supported is having but also the color as well and trying to think about how diverse that is and that can lead to conversations of different what are the different types of fruit and veg and what are the what are the different colors and just bring that to the attention and, and start the conversation and again that's why with the with our health by science play it's all about getting as much vegetables into that plate as you can um, and getting as many different colors on there as well so other resources we have if you if you fire over to the uh resources tools that we have and um, we've got a meal plan builder which makes it again just helps with the decision making so picking your protein choosing your greens adding some color and then topping it off with some really nice flavoring you've got soup builders and they're probably the most probably the easiest way to get loads of nutrient dense veg into your nutrition it is soup um, and with broth it makes it even better as well you've got stir fry again it's just a by its nature you 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 have to have veg with a, with a stir fryer it's not really a stir fry so it kind of by default you're going to get some really good nutrition there you just maybe want to make sure you pack out the the stir fry with with veg and, and your protein source and um rather than having too many carbs and then smoothies are, are a great way of um getting through and like claire showed with her story it makes it colorful can make it fun and they taste awesome there's loads of different variations you can use once you're used to fruit smoothies you can be brave and try um adding some veg in there i know it sounds 
minging, but uh, it does actually taste quite nice. And you don't really, they don't really have a strong taste. Um, and so it, it is actually surprisingly good. So that could be a, a good little challenge. And the other thing with smoothies, they're really quick. You can whip one up um, if you have a blender in, in two minutes. If you've got frozen, vet, uh, frozen fruit in the freezer, it makes life very, very, very easy. And you can also think of food swaps. Now, I know what you're thinking here. There's a big, there's a big gap between chips and carrot sticks. Um, but again, you know, between perfect and given up, there's there is better. So making your own sweet potato wedgies or moving on to potatoes. It might be for you or it might be for a person you support. Just moving along this kind of trail of, of improvement will improve health even going from biscuits to oat biscuits you might think well no that's oat biscuits aren't good for you well they're better than biscuits so if that's a positive change you can make then you're on the right track if you can keep it consistent then you're you're going to make a lot of improvements in your health another little um hack you can use is frozen pre-chopped veg so any supermarket now going to the frozen aisle you'll see frozen pre-chopped veg and they are can be a massive time saver because they can actually be more nutrient dense than fruit and veg you buy off the shelf because they've been frozen at source so they have that nutrition still in them there are there are two things that typically kill um nutrition and that is oxygen so just being out and and heat so obviously if you overcook your veg and fruit you, you're not going to get um you're going to lose nutrition but if you leave it out obviously they'll go mold and you lose nutrition as well so buying frozen means it, it can stay there for months potentially um and you've got that goodness the whole time you can dive into the freezer and whip out some awesome nutrition and if you want my little veg hack i'll let you onto a little secret that i stole uh from a friend so it's not really mine but i'm going to claim it um is using frozen veg Put a little bit of olive oil and salt and then whack it in the microwave for seven and a half minutes. It tastes awesome. It does taste the, it obviously tastes a bit better with a bit more olive oil and salt. So don't go too crazy, but it's a, in 10 minutes, you can have a really good side dish or part of your main meal. Um, and it's awesome. So I strongly recommend giving that a try. And you can find all of these resources on our website that um, Ross will put in the chat box now for you. And on the website, you can see we've got the free tools, the free resources, the change idea cheat sheets, and loads of other calculators, resources, articles that you can that you can access as well. But some of these might fail. Like we have to, again, we keep talking about failure, but it's because your relationship with failure really dictate how successful you are. But that is okay. And ultimately, if you want a bit of a helping hand in, in embracing failure, learning from that failure, then again, join the Accountability Academy for July. A couple of spaces left. Um, so go to the link in the chat box and sign up. It starts next week. So on that, the question is, Ross, is eating fruit and veg worth the effort? That was a bit of a marathon. Apologies to you all. I was just... Um, I was Someone in, someone in pain there. <laughs> um, yeah, I was just going to answer Beck's question. That Beck's asked a really good question. So uh, doesn't uh, pureeing fruit change the structure and make them less healthy than eating whole fruit? That's a really good, uh, really good point. So um, I guess there's probably two types of pureeing. One would be uh, blending, and then the other one would be juicing. So Anne Marie, are you okay to mute your mic? There we go. Sorry, I didn't realise it was on. I'm about to send for help. Um, yeah, so when it comes to purine, there's probably two ways to think about it. One is juicing, another is uh, blending. So when we're talking about smoothies, that's generally blending, uh, which would retain the nutrients. But that's not, if somebody has digestive issues, then they may they struggle to take in um, just blended smoothies. So you might have to look at juicing. Now, juicing does extract some of the nutrients, but it's still 
um, it's still going to be of benefit. So if your only option would be to do that, then um, juicing is definitely still useful. Um, but it's good to be aware that, if possible, blending, that's the whole fruit and whole veg that would be in there. Um, so that's definitely uh, not going to remove the nutrition. Um, I don't know. I hope that answers your question, Beck. Yes, thanks. Yeah, I think it's it's. Um, I've read somewhere about how the the structure changes and the sugars change, and just being mindful, particularly if you're diabetic or heading towards diabetes as well, around being careful. But I think there's also there's that pragmatic balancing thing that if it is the only way that you're going to get fruit and veg in, then it makes sense as well. So I think it's about taking a balanced view um, to these yeah. things. Yeah, hundred percent. It's um... The, I guess it's essentially doing what, if you imagine what you're, it's just skipping a few stages of digestion. So it's what your mouth would have done in terms of breaking it down. So it would be uh, more readily available. So if somebody is diabetic, then it's, um, it would be a consideration. Um, it's mainly the fruit that's going to bring about the sugars. Uh, so you might just want to limit or use, um, you know, fruits with less, less fructose, less sugar in them. Uh, but if the emphasis is on all the other stuff, you know, the veg and things, as long as you have a small amount of fruit, it's generally going to taste okay anyway. Yeah, and also remember, um, with uh, fruit juice, orange juice, never, you know, you never think about it growing up, but you just have a glass of orange juice, you think it's pretty healthy, and then you never stop to think how many oranges are actually in that orange juice. There's like, I think it was when I, I was on holiday once and I actually saw someone make it, I remember thinking, oh yeah, there's a lot of oranges in that glass without any of the the skin or the or the fiber. Um, tastes amazing, but need to be quite mindful of, of that, which um, which you get. I guess it's just juicing, isn't it? As, again, like you said. I think it was like um, was in our innocent smoothies. They had um, did a, a incredible marketing from them, but they were um, the sugar content at them is is. Um, you know, they've got loads of sugar in them. The in innocent, you mean? Yeah, 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 innocent. Yeah, that's a good point. Because I guess, like, when you look at the sugar content on the back, you don't know what normal is. Like, you're not going to go and get a spreadsheet out and try and work out if you took those individual bits of fruit and then um, did it yourself, what, what that would be. So, yeah, that's a really good point. Brilliant. Has anyone got any, um, any other questions? Or should we move on to um, veganism? Let's go for it. Go. Yeah, just there, um, Kat, yeah, that's uh, Kat was saying that she made fresh orange juice the other day and it took five oranges uh, for two small yeah. cups. I was amazed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's surprising. There you go. Cool. Okay, so we'll try and get um, into this. So the pros and cons of veganism. So I must admit, when um, Andrew Thompson um, brought it up, I did feel a little bit like this. But um, it's a really interesting topic. I'm, I'm really glad we've, uh, we're talking about it. So before we dive into it, I don't want to get too geeky and, and, and put you to sleep just after lunch. But it's always important to remember like where the highest quality of evidence comes from. Why, how do we know what isn't so? And right down the bottom, you would have kind of opinion and blogs and, and stuff like that. And we need research to kind of try and test these theories out. And it's only through research that we, we know what works and lots of media outlets will say, you know, research has found, I'm looking at the daily mail here. I think they are the worst culprits in the UK. Um, lots of like good debunking for us. So I kind of love hate relationship with the daily mail. I love debunking them, but hate the fact that people take it as, as face value. So typically um the you need to be careful about where you're which media out that you're looking at and be quite you know critical trying to look at both sides of the argument that's, that's what i've tried to do today i don't really have a strong opinion either way but i did try and look at the pros and cons um from it from a neutral mindset really so what is veganism to start with so veganism is the practice of eating only food not derived from animals and typically of avoiding the use of other animal products. That's just a nice little definition so we know on what we're talking about. But why? Well, typically there are three arguments. There is environmental reasons. 
and this is pretty irrefutable um veganism would be better for the planet point simple so here's a big study that was that was in nature and they were looking at options for keeping the food system um below the the the, the limits that we need to avoid catastrophic damage and what they were looking at is they were looking at veganism but also flexitarian um diet which is basically a lot less meat especially red meat and what they found that this this would reduce the the risk of of global warming quite dramatically by about 52 percent so if we want to half the damage to the planet we can we can um, be fairly confident we can do that by eating less meat. So that's quite a, even with an error margin there, that is, that's huge. I mean, we haven't got all day to kind of go into the reasons for that, but nature, we can trust nature because it's one of the highest quality journals. There's a lot of pseudoscience out there, but nature has to go through, to get something published in nature, you have to go through such a rigorous process of, lots of scientists dedicating their time to try and prove that you're wrong. So when those ideas come through, we know that we can take that as, as with a high level of confidence and we should really listen to what they're saying. And the Committee on Climate Change, that's the UK's um, government body basically, who advises the government um, or tries to advise the government on, on what they should be doing. And, and yeah, they, they come up with a very similar conclusion that a flexitarian or veganism type diet will would massively um, improve our chances of uh, hitting our targets for global warming so that's a really strong argument if you want to go and and look at that in a bit more detail if you want to look at your own carbon footprint then wwf have a really good calculator which just helps you look at simple like lifestyle habits really um, and and it gives you a good idea of like which things actually matter um, which is which is quite useful and um yeah the the two the two diets that they were looking at is is flexitarian diets and and veganism the other argument for veganism is is animal welfare reasons and this is a bit a bit trickier because there's a lot of opinion in here um we know that factory farming is is rife um more so probably in other countries, but the UK certainly isn't perfect. And if you could, you could argue if we all saw where our food came from, we, we might be a bit horrified and we might change our decisions, but we're very detached from where our food comes from because it looks the same in the supermarket. If you want more information, Compassion World Farming, they're quite a good organization which shed light on the reality of where our food comes from that we're, we're quite well sheltered from. Um, so that's a good place to go if you want more information. But, you know, the, the simple things you can do is think about going to your local butcher and you can actually ask them where their meat comes from. So find out where, where they're from, see if they're local. And also there is the RSPCA assured um, stamp. Um, some people might critique it and say it's not strong enough, but it's certainly better than the red tractor and other ones. And so they... Um, give their stamp of approval that the animal welfare standards are are good. And surprisingly, Aldi um, have a lot of that. That's the first place I saw it. But now M&S are the biggest um, advocates of the RSPCA stamp. So if you are going to buy meat, little things like that sends a signal to the market that people demand that um, animals are, uh, are in good condition, basically, when we're... Um, we're rearing them now the third reason which the one that we were interested in mainly is the health reasons and this is the one that we're going to dive into so i think the, the animal welfare and environmental reasons are strong and the health reasons are the ones that <laughs> in about 10 15 minutes i'm going to try and rattle through so the benefits and start with the good points the benefits are quite simple like if you if you cut out meat and animal products, you, you have to eat nutrient dense foods. Like you haven't really got a choice. Otherwise, unless you, unless you just really um, don't care for food and, and you, you have quite boring nutrition, then you could get away just eating hummus all day. But really, if you want to eat good food, you have to eat lots of beans, legumes, fruit, veg, nuts, 
loads of really good quality food so it's almost like by default you're going to eat more of that stuff and that's not to say that you can't do that if you're in a if you eat meat as well um it's just you could argue it's a lot less likely because it's easier to fall back on uh, those convenience foods which typically have more animal products in them so if you eat more nutrient-dense food like we've just been through your body's going to be much much better off um, so whether or not it's a direct effect of veganism, it's the more fruit and veg consumption it's, and, and the, the more quality food um, intake is what's key here. And you could argue that that's more likely to happen um, if you follow a, a vegan diet. It can also help with weight loss. I mean, if you, if you cut out, um, again, animal animal produce it can help um reduce your energy intake which is what you need if you want to lose weight and that's especially true if you replace a lot of those foods with beans legumes which are very high in fiber and, and fruit and veg again um you you know if you have a good quality nutrition you're probably going to reduce your calorie intake but there's no guarantees of that <laughs> there's a lot of people who get really stuck into their vegan brownies and there's a lot of vegan treats. Um, so it's not a guarantee, but if you, if you do it properly and you try and eat a varied diet on a vegan diet, you, you, you probably, it's, I'd put my money on you losing weight if, if that's what um, your goal was. But the negatives, so I put potential negatives because they're not, they don't have to be negatives. Um, they just could be perceived as negative if you don't address them. So the first one is vitamin B12. And <clears throat> yet it gets thrown around a lot that vegans don't get vitamin B12. It's quite simple. You, you can take a vitamin supplement for that. You know, you don't want to get in the habit of taking vitamin supplements for everything. But supplements are there, you know, for, for rare one-off cases. And vitamin B12 is, is a good example. Like that is pretty much the only, the only micronutrient you're deficient in, which is not bad considering that most meat eaters are probably deficient or we're all probably deficient in some, in some vitamins and minerals. We can't always be getting all of the vitamins and minerals all the time. It's, it's unless we're getting 10 portions of fruit and veg a day and eating very, very high quality nutrition, the chances are at some points we're going to be deficient. So taking a vitamin supplement is not a big deal. <clears throat> The big one um, is do vegetarians get enough protein? So I found this resource from nutritionfacts.org. And uh, I'll just let you watch the first part. The largest study in history of those eating plant-based diets recently compared the nutrient profiles of about 30,000 non-vegetarians to 20,000 vegetarians and about 5,000 vegans, flexitarians, and no meat except fish eaters, allowing us to finally put to rest the perennial question, do vegetarians get enough protein? The average requirement is 42 grams of protein a day. Non-vegetarians get way more than they need, and so does everyone else. On average. Okay, so I'm going to stop it there because um, that looked like quite a, an authoritative video um, from Nutritional Facts, which just has a lot of really good stuff. That's where I got the Daily Dozen app idea from. But it's, it's completely untrue. So I looked at that research paper that he um, was quoting, and there's no, the numbers in terms of the protein intakes were were true but the recommendation that he threw out there right at the start which the average recommended intake is 42 grams is it, just completely wrong and if you know if you weren't looking for that you wouldn't notice it and you would take that at face value so we need way more than unless you're an infant um you need way more um than that so we know that the um a lot of the guidelines would say 0.8, but they need to be updated because the research has moved on. And it's um, it's one of those few areas in nutrition that is, that's quite irrefutable. There's such a strong body of research showing the benefits of these minimum intakes that um, you need extraordinarily, extraordinary evidence to counter these claims in order to move it. And everyone in the scientific community would be willing to do that. 
So 1.2 grams is the minimum um, kind of optimal daily intake that we need. Um, so that's important to bear in mind that although you might see videos like that, you need to be a bit skeptical whether you're vegan or not. It doesn't, doesn't matter, but we need um, a good amount of, of protein intake. And the other um, thing to bear in mind is that to be, if you're going to go into veganism, it does take a bit more planning and preparing. It, convenient foods are harder to come by, although things are changing very, very quickly. And there's more and more foods coming out. But typically, you're going to need to plan, prepare nutrition a lot. And that is fine. And it's perfectly doable. It's just to bear in mind that some people might find that hard. After a long day, um, you might find it difficult. I think it is something you can learn. Um, and please correct me if I'm wrong here, but I think it's one of those things like any change you're trying to make, that it, it, if you go too hard too soon, it can be difficult. So this isn't a criticism against veganism. It's just to say that if you're making a drastic change to nutrition, you, you need to be prepared to have that time to plan and prepare uh, in order to do so. Um, because we, the easier we make it for ourselves, the more likely we are to sustain that change unless we are really really motivated um it's going to be it's going to be hard to sustain those changes so between perfect and given up there is better and so that's why i'm not suggesting that anyone should be vegan or anyone should be <laughs> should be sad just saying that if we're looking at veganism from the aspect that it's better for the environment it's be better for animal welfare whether you care about that or not and you're more likely to eat a lot more fruit and veg with veganism if you're eating a standard american diet right now and you want to become vegan you might find it easier to to bridge the gap with a flexitarian diet which is reducing meat consumption and i think that's um often a more persuasive argument for um for, for moving towards that area whether it is for environmental health or animal welfare reasons now there are some shortcuts you can take so I said that it, um, it can be hard. You need to plan and prepare, but you don't have to. You know, if you have ready-made um, meals, you can get food delivered to your door, which tastes awesome, has enough protein, and you don't have to think about it. That is very possible and very easy to do. It just costs a bit of money. That's the, that's the drawbacks. You have to be prepared to make that investment. Um, so we made vegan meals. So... Uh, Gusto and HelloFresh will provide you with all the ingredients you need and with the recipes, and then you just have to cook it. So you just choose it on the menu at the start of the week. So full disclosure, I use um, Gusto, and there are some awesome vegan meals um, in there. And a lot that we would have been skeptical reading it, you might have thought, actually, can't imagine that's going to be great, but we'll give it a go. And it's very, very surprising. So I think that that's a really good way of basically allow, let Gusto decide which meals are likely to be tasty because they're not going to give you horrible meals because they're going to lose you as a customer. So that's quite a good intervention. If you want to start eating more vegetarian, more vegan meals, that's a really, really good place to go uh, to try and do that. Um, or you can use meal plans and recipe ideas. There's loads out there on BBC. Ross will put in the chat box and we're adding vegan uh, meal plans to our nutrition calculator. So if you put in your, um, your specific information, it will tell you how many calories you need and then uh, give you a meal plan based on that as well. So we're, we're going to be putting that, um, updating that this week so that you can access meal plans and we'll, we'll send an email out once that's done. So should you become a vegan? Ross? <laughs> Is that a yes, no answer? No, absolutely not. <laughs> um, well, first of all, Bex, have I, have I, um, uh, have I approached that in, in a fair way or um, have, I, I'm keeping, have I missed the mark somewhere? No, I think you've, you've given a very balanced, um, very balanced account of the reasons for, I don't think it should be for or against. No. I think a lot of these decisions that we make about our lives are down to personal choice. And it's about people doing so from an informed basis. Um, and I think, you know, that that's that for me, if people can think about what they're doing, then 
from all benefits of what we're putting in our mouths from the environmental impact, the health impact, all of those different things that you've just talked about, if we're just thinking about it, then it makes a big difference. Um, but yeah, I'm certainly not somebody that would go around trying to ram veganism down people's throats. It has to be something that you want to do. But if people are curious, if they're interested, if they want some recipes, anything like that, then I'm more than willing to, to have conversations. But what I would say is a little word of warning from my own perspective is the rise in veganism over the last couple of years has been huge. And as such, you know, people marketing things has also increased. So there are, as you said earlier, an awful lot of vegan junk food ideas. Vegan junk food isn't a healthier option. You know, it's junk food across the board. So, yeah, that would just be my word of caution that treat, treat it as you would any other junk food as an occasional treat as part of a balanced diet. Um, so, yeah, no, I think, think, think you did well. <laughs> oh, cheers. Good, good, good. Um, any thoughts on that, Ross? That was very good. Did a very good balanced job there, sir. Very impressed. Yes. Good, good. Has anyone got any um any questions? We'll try and answer it in one minute or uh or um or you can send an email uh if that's easier. Cool, yeah. Kat said my view is that you really need to have good cooking skills to be able to try and ingredient spices unless you can afford deliveries like good. Yeah, yeah, true. I think that we're fortunate that with Gusto, I'm living with the in-laws at the moment before we move into a house. So where's more of you, it's cheaper, um, which is, which helps. But yeah, if there's, if there's less uh, people, then it can be more expensive, but um, cool. Well, um, probably good point to, to wrap it up then. Um, next, or in two weeks time, we're gonna be looking at, um, sleep um i think it's francesco wanted us to look at that so we'll look at sleep next week uh, how to engineer a good night's sleep so if you struggle to get to sleep or you wake up feeling horrible every morning then this is the webinar for you we're going to talk about what it takes to wake up feeling fresh it is possible it doesn't happen very often and sleep is always neglected but it's arguably the most important area i know we just had a good strong argument for fruit and veg but sleep is right up there as well so we'll talk about that and um yeah look forward to catching up with um with everybody then thank you well, guys cheers everybody thank you thanks bye